Every year in late July, early August, when training camps start, we get inundated with beat reports of players showing up in the best shape of their life. We got Twitter videos everywhere with, you know, everybody on the team making one-handed catches, running backs running around cones faster than they've ever run around cones before. And it can be difficult to know, like, what's worthwhile news and what is just Homer beat reporter fluff. It's tough. It can be very tough to know what to pay attention to, so much so that sometimes I just want to say what the fuck is up with all these beat reports. But that's why I'm Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at No More Parties, and I'm here today to give you five training camp storylines that I actually give a shit about and think are worth our time. Let's do it. <laughs> The first training camp report that I actually care about is that Michael Thomas is back and is looking good. He has been an upside pick in best ball drafts all summer based on essentially maybe he'll play and like he used to be really good. If he plays, it could be good. He was activated off of the physically unable to perform list, I believe on the second day of training camp. And beat reports pretty unanimously say that he looks explosive in and out of cuts, that he looks rejuvenated, that he looks like the old Michael Thomas. And, you know, he's been quoted as having said, as being like pretty emotional coming back. There were some questions, you know, during his long absence, like he missed all of last season, was gone for a large portion of the previous season. There were people that were like, does he even give a shit anymore? Is he ever going to play again? Is this an actual, like, you know, injury complications? Or is he just kind of, like, over it and not working hard to get back? He's been emotional. Sounds like he really cares and is is overjoyed about being back on the field again. I think we can put those concerns to rest. But he's back, and he looks good. He hasn't participated in 11-on-11 drills yet. And so it's, it's, like, it's worth monitoring his progression because he's not quite, you know, a full go yet. But so far, so good. And this matters, obviously, because he was a record-setting wide receiver one the last time we saw him healthy for an entire season. And then even the season after that, when he was dealing with a high ankle sprain, a hamstring strain at different points of the season in 2020, he didn't score any touchdowns, but he was still catching passes at a 97 reception and 1,064-yard pace over a 17-game season. He was still a legit player in the league, even playing hurt that year. And the second part is that we've never seen him without Drew Brees, but his now quarterback, Jameis Winston, supported Chris Godwin and Mike Evans as the wide receiver two and wide receiver four in PPR points per game back in 2019. This is a dude who slings it and who can support multiple fantasy relevant receivers in his offenses. They've got a much rejuvenated receiving core in New Orleans this year with potentially Michael Thomas back, rookie Chris Olave. Jarvis Landry like this is a legitimately talented wide receiver core and Thomas is currently being drafted as the wide receiver 34 I believe in the late fifth round of drafts right now but he carries as much upside as literally anybody in that range if he's healthy we're getting healthy Michael Thomas with a DGAF quarterback and Jameis Winston this could be wheels up but I think what's really helpful here is that there's no way he gets priced at his ceiling at any point by the time the regular season starts. Like, even if we get reports that, like, Michael Thomas is 100%, he's feeling good, maybe he plays in some, I don't know, some preseason games and puts up two touchdowns, like, whatever. The most positive things that could possibly come out of training camp and preseason reports for Michael Thomas, they're still not going to result in him being priced at his ceiling because his his ceiling is being, like, an elite wide receiver in fantasy. And so while risk remains, he's going to be a high upside pick no matter where his ADP settles throughout the rest of this month. It's good news that Michael Thomas is back. We'll have to monitor his progression. Who knows if he plays week one, what ends up happening there. But I think regardless of where his ADP settles in, it's not going to be at his ceiling. Michael Thomas is going to be a good pick as long as we keep hearing positive news throughout training camp. The second story that I care about is that James Robinson avoided the PUP completely. All summer, we, or at least I, have been operating under the assumption that like James Robinson could potentially be a non-factor this season almost completely. He tore his Achilles in, I think, December it was, and, you know, that is a serious injury, first of all, and second of all, like, takes a little bit of time for recovery, and completely avoiding the PUP is big for him. Like, he's he's so far along in his recovery that he doesn't even need, like, a temporary, you know, training wheels type recovery here in training camp. He's ready to go and practice already. He's not a full go. 
in drills, you know, like similar to Michael Thomas, he's kind of being eased back in, but he's not on the physically unable to perform list, which I think really matters. And while I'm not drafting James Robinson, expecting anything in fantasy football this year, I think this is especially big for projections about Travis Etienne and his upside and floor for this coming season. I think his ceiling, Travis Etienne's ceiling with James Robinson is the same because James Robinson might not be fully healthy to start the season, even if he gets cleared. Like Cam Akers came back after tearing his Achilles early in the season last year, came back towards the end of the season and in the playoffs, was cleared to play, but was very, very ineffective, like so bad on a per carry basis. They fed him, which is a good indication for Cam Akers, but like he just, even though he was medically cleared to play, he was not good or effective on a per touch basis at all. That same thing could happen to James Robbins. So I think even if he's cleared, that's not necessarily a sign that like he's fully healthy and ready to go. But if he is healthy, a healthy James Robinson is definitely going to eat into Travis Etienne's floor. He's probably definitely trusted, more trusted with like a legitimate two down role than Snoop Connor would be. Like James Robinson has proven over the past two seasons that he's a legitimate stud NFL running back. And he's also an excellent pass blocker. And we love Etienne because he's like an explosive player out in space. He's, you know, hypothetically going to catch a lot of passes in this offense. There's been positive beat reports about Etienne's, you know, injury recovery. He's looking like the most explosive player at Jaguars camp. He's a more explosive player than James Robinson is, but he's not an especially skilled receiver. And as it pertains to like James Robinson's ability on third downs, if he just has like a steadier ability to, you know, like pass block, he's, he's more reliable in some of those like nuanced situations where, you know, you can't fuck things up and, you know, let a blitz go by and Trevor Lawrence get killed. Etienne is obviously like a more explosive player than James Robinson, but I don't believe he's an especially skilled receiver, which matters when we're projecting like who's going to get a lot of the third down, long down and distance work here between a hypothetically healthy James Robinson and Travis Etienne. What Robinson is bringing to the table is like really excellent pass blocking. And what Etienne is bringing to the table is explosive playmaking out in space. But Etienne is not an especially skilled receiver outside of his ability after the catch. In college football, nationwide, 29.2% of running back targets are screens. So just over a quarter of total running back targets come in the screen game. ETN in college in 2018 as a sophomore had 66% of his targets come on screens. That's two thirds compared to less than a third for running backs nationwide. As a junior in 2019, 61.9% of his targets were screens. And then he, he continued to progress his skill set, his abilities as a receiver as he got older in college. And in 2020, as a senior, 52.5% of his targets came on screens. So even at his like most mature as a, as a receiver, as a route runner in college, he was still seeing screens almost twice as often as running backs nationwide were. Travis Etienne is a great player out in space. I love him. He's an explosive playmaker with the ball in his hand. I don't believe he's he's not DeAndre Swift. He's not Alvin Kamara. He's not a guy that you're going to like line up and have him beat a linebacker one on one or like you know, run these option routes and angle routes out of the backfield, really. He needs to catch a swing pass, catch a screen, make things happen with the ball in his hand. I'm a huge ETN fan, but if James Robinson is healthy and a legitimate part of this offense, the Tevin Coleman role or career arc is not out of the question for Travis ETN because James Robinson could play the Devontae Freeman role in this offense. So while I'm still in on Travis ETN, especially his ceiling outcome this season, given that we don't know if James Robinson will be able to eat into a large enough portion of ETN's workload in order to like reduce that ceiling because we don't know if Robinson's going to be healthy even if cleared. We should be paying close attention to this situation because if James Robinson is playing in preseason and looks good or whatever the case is or if there are reports that he's like 100% back and is looking explosive like we need to temper our expectations for ETN if not of his ceiling of his floor given that James Robinson offers legitimate things in this offense that complement what ETN does well. The third thing that I care about is that Sky Moore and Romeo Dobbs are dominating in training camp. At this point, everybody is in the best shape of their life. Everybody's making highlight plays, but there, there's a difference between like a guy like Michael Thomas coming back from injury and looking good. That means a lot more to me than Devontae Adams looks like he's in the best shape of his life. Like, no shit. He had a couple months off after the season. He should look in the best shape of his life. Michael Thomas coming back and looking good is actually actionable information 
because we didn't know if Michael Thomas would look good coming off his injury. And same thing with rookies. Like, rookies come in, some of them look like the game is too fast for them. Some of them have a hard time acclimating. But if a rookie comes in and beat reporters are pretty much unanimous in fanboying over them every single day, we need to pay attention. Twitter clips, one-off quotes about like, no, oh, this guy looks like he belongs, like don't really matter. But the thing that matters is the drumbeat, like a consistent pattern of like beat reporter comments and, you know, tidbits from camp that say, this is a legit player. And so, and Sky Moore and Romeo Dobbs are two guys who are getting those drum beats. And those things especially matter in situations that these guys find themselves in with A, really good quarterbacks and B, open opportunity in the receiving game. The Sky Moore stuff is not at all surprising to me. I loved his film. Uh, watched a little bit of it for the BDGE draft guide. I gave him an Antonio Brown comp, and that's not to say that like he's going to be as good as Antonio Brown, but like as far as play style goes, that's what I saw from him in college. Golden Tate, you know, somewhere in that range of outcomes. Like I think he's a really, really good player, crisp route runner, really explosive in and out of like covering this guy would just be a complete nightmare. I would absolutely hate to be a defensive back covering Sky Moore. I'm not at all surprised that Sky Moore is dominating in Chiefs camp. Dobbs, on the other hand, is very surprising to me. He was underwhelming on tape. I thought he looked like a broke man's Marvin Jones with like wide receiver three upside in the league. But if he's impressing Aaron Rodgers, like you have to care. There are a lot of smart film analysts who I respect who are fans of Romeo Dobbs. He's playing well in camp. Like these things are building to where we need to start paying attention to Romeo Dobbs, A, in Dynasty, B, low-key redraft pick here with like a wide open receiving core in Green Bay. As these teams like rebuild their, their receiving depth charts with Devontae Adams gone, with Tyree Kill gone, somebody is going to emerge as the number one wide receiver in these offenses in Kansas City. Juju is probably like the default just given his like body of work in the NFL, but I would not be surprised to see Sky Moore be this year's Amon Ross St. Brown and emerge as like a, a weekly fantasy starter at some point this season. And Dobbs could establish himself over the course of the season as well and become a starter at some point down the line. The fourth training camp storyline that I care about is J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards on the pup right now. Dobbins is expected back by week one, but there have, you know, his, his, you know, questions about his, his full recovery, even by that point still remain. The first year back from guys recovering from ACLs is generally pretty slow. They kind of takes them a year or, you know, at least a few months that first year to kind of like reacclimate and start feeling like themselves again. And so Dobbins tore his ACL like an, a full year ago, which is a good thing for this recovery, but it being a full year removed from his injury and he already landed on the pup at the beginning of training camp is not a great sign. Edwards presumably being out, like like reports of his injury recovery are even less positive than for Dobbins. And so him being presumably out, at least at the beginning of the season, is obviously a positive sign for Dobbins' workload, assuming Dobbins can get healthy. But they signed Mike Davis this offseason. They drafted Tyler Beatty. They just signed Corey Clement very recently. And so they're looking at their running back situation like, shit, we need to get more guys in here. And so with Clement, Davis, Beatty, they have dudes to plug in, not especially talented dudes, but like they've collected running backs this offseason that they can plug in if these top two guys aren't healthy. And so it's kind of seeming to me like unless Dobbins can really turn things around quickly here, this could be another loss season for this backfield if Dobbins is not healthy enough to take advantage of Gus Edwards being potentially gone and this being like a wide open depth chart. The fifth thing that I want to talk about is that Isaiah Spiller, based on a report today, uh, I'm filming this on Monday, Based on a report today, Isaiah Spiller is the only non-Austin Eckler running back taking first team reps with the Chargers. And, you know, we see it, we see this a lot where like so-and-so is taking first team reps, so-and-so is running with the ones. Oftentimes that's that's not enough. Like that doesn't really necessarily mean anything. Like I saw a report uh maybe last week, like Melvin Gordon versus Mike Boone, where they're talking about, you know, Javante Williams is the clear one, and then Melvin Gordon and Mike Boone are in like a competition to see who's the clear number two. Like that's probably not actually the case. They probably probably gave Melvin Gordon some plays off or, you know, let him go home early off of practice because he's a veteran and then had, they had somebody else had to take reps and it was Mike Boone. Like, Mike Boone's not taking Melvin Gordon's job. And so, same thing with like Miles Sanders and Kenneth Gainwell. They gave Miles Sanders the day off or whatever it was, you know, let him take it easy for, for a practice. And Kenneth Gainwell was running with the ones and everybody jumped all over it like, oh, Kenneth Gainwell's the starter. I love Kenneth Gainwell. I'm not much of a Miles Sanders guy, but one practice where Kenny Gainwell was jumping in with the ones because Miles Sanders was like in the ice bath is not news. Like, that's just not. But given that it was reported 
reported that like Larry Roundtree's at at practice, Joshua Kelly's at practice, Isaiah Spiller's at practice, and of those three, he's the only guy taking reps with the first team. I think that matters. This is a team that's been looking for a sidekick back to pair with Eckler ever since they lost Melvin Gordon. They haven't found a good one. Maybe Isaiah Spiller's that guy, and we've expected him to be one of the like best handcuffs, potentially carry some standalone value. Like if big if he can earn a legitimate role like alongside Eckler, and this is the first, you know, kind of step to proving that he can do that. It was previously reported that Kelly and Roundtree were also getting work with the ones, but then, you know, a couple days pass and now it's just Spiller. This is definitely a situation worth monitoring where was this like a one-off practice thing? Is this a situation where like Spiller has already kind of supplanted those guys and asserted himself as a dude who deserves to run with the ones obviously above those other dudes? It was previously reported that both Joshua Kelly and Larry Roundtree were also getting work with the ones and that this is like a completely open competition for the RB2 role behind Austin Eckler. And so right now, Isaiah Spiller is being drafted and like we, we expect him to be one of the best handcuffs in the league, potentially carry standalone value if he can earn a legitimate role alongside Eckler. And this is the first step, like playing with the ones, putting these other dudes clearly behind him is the first step to proving that he can make good on that big if. Yeah.